uh, reports that the Justice Department is closing in on Hillary Clinton. Uh, he reports that prosecutors of justice are planning to expand their investigation beyond Hillary's emails to include the Clinton Foundation's finances and Hillary's pay-to-play relationships with foreign businessmen and governments. Well, well, how long have you waited to hear that headline? <laughs> and uh, it, it's delightful that that this seems to be the case. He, um, Ed was in touch with an attorney who's close to Hillary and may actually be representing her or in some way. And uh, he said that all the files compiled by the FBI during its year-long investigation of Hillary's emails have been transferred from the J. Edgar Hoover FBI building to a secure area at the Department of Justice. Um, in addition, prosecutors of justice are demanding to see the Hillary emails that they believe the State Department has withheld from the FBI. Um, and then, of course, the issue arose of a possible plea deal with Hillary, uh, where she would accept guilt uh, but avoid any jail time. And according to this attorney, Hillary threw a fit when he made that suggestion and wouldn't allow him to have any contact with the prosecutors. She told me it's the same old crap, and she didn't use crap. The attorney said, she thinks this will go away like it did in the past, but I warned her that this is not going away. This reminds me of an episode I had with Hillary. Uh, at one point, uh, I had a conversation with somebody who was uh, vaguely close, or fairly close to Kenneth Starr, the special prosecutor going after Bill Clinton. And they implied to me that uh, they were going to proceed with an indictment of Hillary. Bill was concerned about that and thought an indictment was coming down, uh, but that uh, they could work out a plea where she would accept guilt but would not be punished, uh, the same kind of thing she's being offered now. And uh, as now, uh, Hillary threw a total fit and began screaming into the telephone, I won't take a deal, I won't do any of that. I think the idea of Bill's pardoning her answered into it. She said, you tell him I won't take a pardon. If Ken Starr wants to play that way, he's got to come after me, and I'm going to go after him, and this will never happen. Um, this last conversation that I've just recounted is actually quoted in Hillary's memoir, uh, Living History. And um, she says that she assumed that I was carrying water for a Republican client. In fact, I was carrying water for her husband. Okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, in fact, I was carrying water for Bill, who was asking me to sound Hillary out about the possibility of a plea bargain and a pardon. And um, the, uh, it was such that they worked that sometimes they weren't on speaking terms and they needed me to be a go-between with them. But uh, So I have no difficulty believing Ed Klein's account of Hillary's reaction. Now, the wheels of justice grind slowly, and it's been a while waiting for this to happen, uh, so I think this is going to take time. Um, but I do believe that it's significant, very significant, that they're on her case. And um, I think you'll see more and more of this. Now, isn't this interesting? At precisely the time that the case against uh, Donald Trump is crashing and burning, uh, Assange, the head of WikiLeaks, said the Russians did not hack Hillary's email, it was someone else. Most likely, my guess is Seth Rich and a bunch of employees uh, at the, uh, uh, a bunch of employees at the Clinton operation, at the DNC, who were Bernie Sanders supporters and were annoyed uh, like crazy at the bias in favor of Hillary that the theoretically neutral committee was manifesting. And they downloaded the stuff and leaked it uh, to try to embarrass them and correct that. Now, I have no idea if Seth Rich's murder had anything to do with that. I'm not going to go there. But, um, and and, and you, you shouldn't either. I mean, we don't have to convict Hillary of murder to uh, convince everybody that, uh, th that this hacking was an internal job. And the further proof that it was an internal job, not proof, but uh, evidence, uh, is that after the hack occurred and the FBI came in, the DNC refused to let them take the computers. 
um, refused to let them examine them. And the only reason for that that I can see, because uh, the hacking had already happened, uh, is that they were they didn't want the FBI to discover that this may have been an inside job. They'd much rather talk about how grieved they were and offended and the victims of Russian aggression and so on, rather than just magnify a factional dispute within the party. So as the Trump case is collapsing, we have Assange saying that it wasn't a Russian hack. We have the CIA station chief in Moscow uh, saying that there was never any collusion. So as that case is going down, the possibility of a case against Hillary is going up. Things are strange in politics. Dick, what's up with Steve Bannon? Gilda Cobretti asks. Okay, I'll be right on Steve Bannon now. Oh, okay. Anything on any other um, Hillary stuff? Nope, we're okay, good right now. good. Now, um, let me discuss what I think is going on with uh, the Steve Bannon uh, resignation or firing. This is a casualty of the deep state that I've been warning about in my book, uh, Rogue, Spot, Rogue Spooks. Uh, the deep state, that is the permanent employees of the government who have a, a vested interest in policies and practices that have been going on for a long time, who really feel it's their government, and they think Trump is an interloper trying to dislodge and disarrange arrangements that have been going on for a while. They got rid of the three people who Trump depends upon the most. Uh, they got rid of Mike Flynn when he tried to be national security advisor. They sidelined and, frankly, castrated Jeff Sessions uh, when they forced him to recuse himself from the main business of the Justice Department. And now they've gotten Steve Bannon. And I believe that it's entirely possible that this was a deal set up between the minority groups uh, represented by Democratic politicians working in concert with the deep state with the goal of getting rid of Steve Bannon. Uh, because Steve Bannon's Breitbart News publication had given space to deep state writers and not censored them, uh, unlike most other publications, uh, he was labeled unfairly from the very beginning as someone who is potentially sympathetic to the alt-right, to the uh, Nazis and the white supremacists and all of that. It was a bunch of garbage from the beginning. He never was. Uh, but they tried to portray his fairness at uh, Breitbart as being that. And uh, now they've set up a way in which they could use that to fire Bannon. And they took this controversy that is totally manufactured about the Confederate statues. It's not like these statues are hurting anybody. It's not like uh, they're causing any harm. They're just sitting there on the lawn. And uh, why protest them now? How about a year ago or a year from now or 10 years ago or 160 years ago when they were first erected? Uh, they're doing it now because the Obamas and the black leadership in the country wanted more racial polarization. They wanted to use race as a tool against Trump and, I believe, against Bannon. And by raising this issue in inflammatory terms, they, uh, they goaded uh, the uh, ultra-right crazies into confrontation. And they didn't take that much goading. The ultra-right types love the confrontation. They'll sell lots of subscriptions, get lots of donations, lots of members, um, and their enemy is invisibility that they could just fade into the woodwork and nobody would know they were alive. Uh, so this gives them a chance for visibility. And uh, I think that the left and the right worked on doing this uh, because it was in both of their political interest. And I think that the old goal of the deep state, the horse they had in this race, was to get rid of Steve Bannon. Now Donald Trump has a government of strangers. There's nobody there who he came with him. There's nobody there who's part of his inner circle. He has some family members there, but they're themselves somewhat marginalized. And uh, he's governing with a government of strangers, people he never knew, he doesn't rely on, he has no confidence in, no close relationship with. And uh, he's uh, really on his own. Uh, that's not to say he's isolated in the sense that nobody will talk to him, that's nonsense. 
but he is isolated in that the deep state has stripped him of every friend he might have had. And uh, I think that's deliberate, and I think it's part of the coup d'etat process. Uh, you strip him of his allies. Get rid of Mike of Flynn, who would have disciplined the intelligence establishment. Castrate and sideline Jeff Sessions so he doesn't get in the way. And fire Steve Bannon. And I think that really is what's going on here. I think it's a damn shame. And it's all over this totally fabricated crisis uh, about the statues. And Trump never endorsed the Nazis or anything. He condemned them explicitly and in strong terms. Maybe in his second press conference more than in his first. But who cares? But it is wall-to-wall -wall coverage. They won't talk about anything else in the media. And I think they're inflaming this. They're hyping it uh, because they wanted to get rid of Bannon. And I think they've now done so. And I think it's a damn shame. Dick, why does Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter get a pass from so many? Well, I think Black Lives... Dean Li Saylor asks, by the way. I think Black, Li Black Lives Matter was... Uh, and is a, uh, a valid movement. Uh, I think that the, uh, it's important to call attention to um, African-American kids who are killed by police, uh, sometimes through misunderstandings or that kind of thing. And I think they've ultimately had a very positive result, which is cameras, body cameras, on the police officers and on their vehicles. And I think that that is eliminating the kinds of mis- missed signals and miscommunication that, uh, that we're uh, confronting here. And I think that it's been a very positive development. And I think it's a good check and balance on police. I've always supported the idea of a civilian complaint review board to review police actions, and particularly when a fatality is involved, I think it's a good idea to have people who are not in blue and not in uniform and not subject to the military discipline of a police force uh, to weigh in and examine what went on. But what's happening in this is that these civil rights groups have really been hijacked uh, into campaigning against a damn statue. <laughs> Not against a live cop with a gun, but a statue uh, just sitting up there. Uh, sometimes the punster in me wants to say, hasn't the statue of limitations run? <laughs> and I think that, that this is just absurd. It's ridiculous. And I think it trivializes, frankly, the whole protests. Uh, what is the statue of Robert E. Lee doing to somebody? Um, I'm sorry. I'm looking for you know, while I'm doing this, I told this story, I think, uh, a week ago, but it bears repeating because it's so much fun. Uh, I was invited to give a speech at Washington and Lee University. And uh, it was a mock presidential convention. And the kids were all on beach blankets on the lawn, and it was a very attractive setting. And uh, the guy who was supposed to speak with me was Al Sharpton, <laughs> who I knew well from New York. And uh, we were speaking on the steps of Lee Chapel, speaking out to the student body. And uh, I spoke first, and then Sharpton spoke, gave a strong, stem-winding civil rights speech. And then I grabbed the mic and I said, hey, Al, that was one hell of a speech. And he smiled and said, thank you. And I said, do you think it worked? Do you think Robert E. Lee turned over in his grave? And Sharpton looked at me to understand what I meant. And I said, this is Lee Chapel we're speaking in front of Al. Robert is buried right back there. And he's on top of his coffin with his hand in his shirt lying on his back. And I'm wondering if your speech was effective enough to make him turn over in his grave. <laughs> and Sharpton cracked up and everybody laughed. And then I said, well, let's check it out. <laughs> so Sharpton and I walked up the steps to Lee Chapel with all the media following us with their cameras. And uh, there's Lee on his back. And I said, Al, your speech didn't work. He's still there <laughs> on his back. <laughs> uh, I thought you'd turn him over in his grave. <laughs> but uh, there's a limit to which you can use statues uh, as a political foil. And I think we've kind of reached that. Um, well, Dick, there's a quote um, that someone sent in to you, and I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about right now. And it's the quote is from Milan Kundera, and Ronald Quivinen submitted it. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. 
Before long, that nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The struggle of man against power is a struggle of memory against forgetting. Mm. What do you think of that? Brilliant and articulate and really yeah. poetic. Uh, the problem is I don't much agree with it. <laughs> oh, you don't? Okay. Uh, I think that I did a video once where I said the job approval of past presidents is subject to radical fluctuation even long after their death. Because history is really an opinion about events. It's obviously the skeleton of history is recounting what happened when and who won what battle and all that stuff. But when you deal with causality or with interpretation, that or values, that's all really an opinion. And the opinions change over time. For example, I would say that in the last 50 years, Thomas Jefferson has lost a fair amount of prestige because of the focus on slavery and his affair with uh, Sally Hemings and his fathering illegitimate children and then going so much into debt that he couldn't liberate them on his death. On the other hand, I think, and similarly, I think Andrew Jackson has suffered a bit because of the focus on the Trail of Tears, the evacuation of the Cherokee Nation and the Seminoles, and uh, the biological warfare of uh, kind of exposing the smallpox deliberately to try to wipe out their populations, a kind of early genocide. On the other hand, I think Calvin Coolidge has done really well lately because we appreciate the idea of Letting the, govern, letting the economy alone and letting it function on its own, which he did. And uh, I think Woodrow Wilson has done well lately because of our appreciation of the need for globalism and to get past balance of power politics. I think Eisenhower has done very well because of his ability to reign in the military-industrial complex. So we are always revising our opinions of the past. And that doesn't mean we knock down statues like some kind of communist demonstrators, but it does mean that we reassess our opinion of those folks. Now, the statues of Confederate leaders that we're talking about were largely erected 20 or 30 years after the Civil War, many of them not until the 1920s. And that was part of a national movement to reunite America, to heal the wounds. And uh, one of the big parts of that was the book in the movie Gone with the Wind, and its precursor, Birth of a Nation, a movie that basically defended the Ku Klux Klan. And at, there was this sense of unite and become one country again, which basically meant forgive the South for slavery. And uh, it became un-American uh, to hold on to that grudge. And uh, in the course of that, the civil rights movement was horribly undercut. Yeah. This live broadcast has more viewers than any other show in the world on Facebook. Woo! <laughs> In the world. In the world. Wow. Yes. That is Sorry. cool. <laughs> Take that, China. <laughs> so, so people revised their opinions of history. And uh, in the 20s and uh, before, uh, the uh, need to give black people equal rights was secondary, sublimated, to restoring the dignity of the South and to uh, reuniting the country. And uh, that was the opinion then, and that's where these statues went up. Now we're revisiting them and we're saying, hey, uh, Robert E. Lee was a great general and a great man, but come on, he prolonged this war by a year. Uh, the South had no realistic chance to win this war um, after Gettysburg, a little, sort of, but certainly after Lincoln was reelected president. There was a hope that maybe Lincoln would lose and then maybe McClellan, the Democrat, would win and they could then negotiate a solution and Lee was holding out for that. But as soon as Lincoln won re-election, the South had no possibility of winning this, and yet over 100,000 people on both sides died because one man wouldn't step away. Now, he wasn't the president, but he could have ended that civil war any time he chose to. So we're reassessing the places of people in history, and I think that's legitimate. That's not eradicating history. That's growing it and understanding it well. Um, Dick, Mike Starr wants to know, are the Republican legislators afraid of the Clintons? Um, hmm, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think there was a fear of the Clintons because of all their, their power and money. Uh, but I think that's pretty well gone now. Uh, they're pathetic figures right now. And would it be possible that Bannon would serve our president better than behind the scenes? Renee Durant asks. 
I don't know if there is such a thing as behind the scenes with Donald Trump. Uh, behind the scenes is something you can do with a senator or a governor or a congressman who have to make maybe one or two or three difficult decisions every month or so. Uh, with the president, where it's every five minutes, you're either there or you're not there. And if you're there, you're commenting on what's happening, and if you're not there, you're out of the loop and you're gone. And even if he really values your idea, you can't do that. Now, I kept my influence with Clinton while I operated behind the scenes, but that's because he phoned me every three minutes. And I was just constantly in touch with him. But uh, it's a tough act to do. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Barcelona. Uh, the tragedy of Barcelona is not just the terrorism. It's the lesson, the Munich lesson, relearned again and again of the dangers of appeasement. Uh, I handled the campaign for the guy who's now the Prime Minister of Spain, Rajoy, and uh, he was, I worked for him in two elections, one he lost and then the one where he won. The one where he lost had a unique situation. The previous president was a guy named Aznar, who was very, very popular, and his party was the moderate centrist party. The opponents were the leftists, the socialist party way, way out here. And uh, Aznar had a pretty good record. People liked him. And, uh, but he had committed to supporting Bush in the war in Iraq. And there were Spanish troops in Iraq. And uh, the left opposed him on that, attacked him. And then five days before election day, Al-Qaeda blew up a train uh, outside of Madrid and killed something like 40 or 50 people. And it was to protest Aznar's involvement in the war in Iraq. Now, when 9-11 happened, our reaction in the U.S. was to double down and pursue Al-Qaeda more heavily, more aggressively, and really go after them. But Spain had a different history, uh, including being ripped apart by a civil war uh, that really ended only about 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And uh, they chose appeasement. Uh, their attitude was, oh, let's not get involved with this. This isn't our fight. We have no business looking at Iraq. The war on terror is something for the U.S. and the U.K. What have we got to do with it? So they backpedaled, and they withdrew from Iraq. They rejected my candidate, Rajoy, who was Aznar's favorite candidate, and they voted for the leftist, a guy named um, Sabatero. And uh, he withdrew from Iraq, withdrew from the war on terror, and did everything he could not to rifle, not to rile al-Qaeda. And this is what just happened, uh, this terrorist attack. Uh, they know that they can really get to Spain by that tactic. And the other thing it's a casualty of is unlimited Muslim immigration into the European Union. There are no effective constraints on refugees coming into Europe. And the leaders of Europe grandly open the doors and quote the Statue of Liberty and all that stuff. But it's letting terrorists into the country. And, you know, not only was there the bombing yesterday, but today there were reports of smoke all over the airport. I'm not sure what that, what that turned out to be, but it may have been another terrorist attack. And uh, the U.S. apparently warned Spain that al-Qaeda was targeting, and ISIS was targeting Barcelona. Uh, and uh, they ignored it. There was not the, the protection that was necessary, the security that was necessary, because Spain has no offense in the war on terror, and the EU will not take steps to limit migration. Uh, it's a big problem for Germany uh, because people come into Germany from the Balkans and Italy. But with Italy and Spain, they're right there. They're right in the Mediterranean. And... Um, boat people coming constantly in, carrying all kinds of terrorists with them. And if anybody ever doubts the need for Donald Trump and his policy of stopping people from terror countries coming into the United States, they should go to Barcelona and see how not following that policy works. Dick, do you think that George Soros is to blame for so much of this turmoil? Carl Korosdowski asks. I don't think Soros is to blame in the sense that he's strategizing it. I think he puts up a lot of the money and he keeps a lot of organizations in Wheaties that otherwise would be broke and starving. So to that extent, it's his fault. But uh, he's not calling the shots. A lot smarter people than he are are doing that. 
Now, um, this uh, broadcast was sponsored uh, by the Patriot Gold Group. And uh, how did you like losing 4% of your retirement in the last two days? In the stock market, plunged almost 400 or 500 points uh, as a result of the instability in Washington and the terror attacks in Barcelona. And that's the risk you have when your entire portfolio for your retirement is in the market or in mutual funds. Mutual funds are such a, such a farce. They're supposed to be diversified investments. Uh, it's like saying, well, I have Camembert, and I have Gruyere, and I have Brie, and I have all different kinds of cheeses, so I've diversified. You haven't diversified. It's all cheese. <laughs> and mutual funds, you're buying stocks, all different stocks, all different sectors, but they're still stocks. And uh, it shows the importance, I believe, of diversification. So call the Patriot Gold Group, patriotgoldgroup.com, and their phone number is 800-476-5675. Thanks. We got other stuff? We sure do. Um, Sue Bongiovanni wants to know, how can our country survive? What can we do? How can our country survive? What can we do? Well, first, we can elect Donald Trump president, which we've done and we can fight to keep them there. Uh, we have, you've seen in the last week how vicious and overwhelming the firestorm created by the media is. Uh, there was no national crisis about these statues. They weren't mugging anybody in the park. They were just sitting up there on horses. Uh, there was no crisis about this. Uh, and to, so, But they ginned it up. They fomented one. Uh, they passed some laws to remove some of the statues, and that uh, inflamed uh, crazy Nazis who Bannon correctly called clowns. Uh, and uh, they confronted the others like street battles in Germany in the 30s. And then the media seized on it. Uh, Trump didn't, wasn't forceful enough in condemning them. All he said was that there's hate and blood on both sides, and it has to stop. I didn't see anything left, left, less forceful about that, but others did. And uh, they piled on. Everybody, they induced companies to quit the business council because otherwise their customers would say they were racist. You know what happened the other day? The arts council quit. Oh, my God. How is Donald Trump going to run the country without a panel of artists to advise him on aid to the arts? I don't see how he can. He needs to resign. Uh, the media goes crazy. And it blows things out of all proportion. And that's what's happening now. And you just get past it. It goes away. It stops. Uh, the danger is that they take casualties with them, like a good man like Steve Bannon. And those don't grow on trees. You can't replace a Steve Bannon. You can't go back through the election and have a battle mate, a trench mate, a guy in the foxhole with you who went through that entire experience with you and get rid of him and then replace him with somebody that just walked in off the street. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Uh, but in terms of the country getting through it, it's going to do fine. And don't forget, the country is doing pretty damn well. Uh, unemployment is way down. Job creation is way up. Uh, we're becoming the number one energy country in the world. Um, our border crossings are way down, illegal and legal. And uh, we're on our way to doing rather well as a country. It's just the damn media that plays up everything they can to make you feel like it's falling apart. So relax. <laughs> Dick, why do you think Pelosi is jumping on the idea to take down the monuments in the Capitol? Noel Horvath asks. Um, she even endorsed a motion by my former high school roommate, uh, Jerry Nadler, congressman from New York, really? to censure Trump uh, and uh, put that on the party agenda. It's the same part mm -hmm. of this thing. Uh, look, they can't deliver prosperity to the black community. They can't lower the dropout rate. They can't reduce the teen pregnancy rate. They can't reduce the AIDS infection rate. So they take down statues. I mean, this is all an admission of the impotence and the ineffectuality of the Democratic Party in helping minority communities. In fact, I would argue that the Democrats do better with poverty than with prosperity. The more poor people there are, the more Democrats there are. And the more well-off people there are, the more Republicans there are. And they would <coughs> rather keep African Americans back on the plantation 
poor and banded together politically so they're useful to them than solve their problems. Renee? I'm looking. We need more questions, guys. <laughs> okay, now, uh, there is a very important issue that Bannon raised in his uh, deathbed interview the other day, uh, which is that Trump ought to be making more of the finding in May uh, by the FISA court that Obama, in the last year of his administration, had ordered surveillance on 30,000 Americans. The way it came about is that uh, the uh, NSA, National Security Administration, has the right to collect metadata that is the phone number they called, the amount of time they spent on the phone and where they called from, with any conversation between an American here in the U.S. or a foreigner here in the U.S. and someone abroad in another country. But they're not allowed to go through the text of the conversation and they're not allowed to publish it. Well, sometimes uh, the FISA court will permit them to actually hear the conversation, uh, but never to release the name of the American involved, never to even know the name of the American. That's a process called masking, where they hold the name of the American, like they tried to do with, with Mike Flynn in his conversation with the Russians. Well, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2013, uh, Obama unmasked, um, Obama unmasked 371 people. In 2016, he unmasked 30,355. I'm sorry, the other number was 198, and this last year it was 30,000. And what that is is that he basically blew the lid off intelligence gathering. He also got an executive order increasing the number of agencies that were entitled to get this information. So instead of one or two, 17 in the government were authorized to receive this information. During his final year in office, Obama's team significantly expanded efforts to search national security agency intercepts for information about Americans, distributing thousands of intelligence reports across government with the unredacted names of U.S. residents during the midst of a divisive 2016 election. This data made available by the National Intelligence Agency provides the clearest evidence to date of how information accidentally collected, collected by the NSA overseas about Americans was subsequently searched and distributed. When they say accidentally, what they mean is that uh, the uh, foreigner calls an American or talks to an American. And we're not interested in the American because he's an American and that would be an unlawful search. But the foreigner, we have no compunctions about. And if in the course of monitoring the foreigner, we find stuff going on with an American, that's accidental, and the name of the American may not be disclosed. But Obama blew through that stop sign and disclosed 30,000 names and expanded the pool of agencies that get that information. Obama loosened privacy protections to make such sharing easier in 2011 in the name of national security. The revelations are particularly sensitive since the NSA is legally forbidden from directly spying on Americans and its authority to conduct warrantless searches on foreigners is up for renewal in Congress this year. And it comes as lawmakers investigate President Trump's own claims that they were eavesdropping on him. In all top government officials, conducted 31,000 searches in 2016, seeking information about Americans in NSA intercept metadata, which included telephone numbers and email addresses. The activity amounted to a 28% increase over the previous year, uh, and more than triple the 9,500 such searches that occurred in 2014. So I believe that this should be investigated. Uh, it should not be swept under the rug. Uh, this administration has so many things justifiably to complain about in the last administration, not just Hillary and her emails and pay for play and bribery at the State Department, but this controversy as well. 
and it is time that Trump put some points on the board. Jeff Sessions, please listen. Uh, get active, get involved, get moving on this stuff uh, so that we can put some offense on for our side so the media coverage is not all anti-Trump, but we can get a word in edgewise. And Bannon suggested we go after this in that last interview of his, and I think that's a hell of an idea. I'm kicking myself that I didn't think of it, but I'm glad that Steve did. Dick, what do you think of Alan West as chief strategist? Edmund Brooks wants to know. I don't think West would be a great strategist. Uh, he's a brilliant man. He's a, uh, he's a brave man, uh, and I agree with him. He thinks soundly and correctly about issues. But, you know, strategist is a different set of skills. You have to be a good chess player for that. I once asked Alan West, uh, what's it like serving in Congress after war, the war in Iraq? And he said, well, I can't shoot anybody in Washington. <laughs> so what we're looking at today with the uh, news of Bannon and uh, the uh, other news of the Confederate issue uh, is that we're looking at a deep state that is expanding its tentacles and taking control of every aspect of the American government, and like a cancer, forcing out healthy cells that can guide it in the right direction. And we predict all of this, we write all of this. In the book Eileen and I wrote, Rogue Spooks, The Intelligence War on Donald Trump. Um, I, I can't urge you strongly enough to get a copy, because I can't possibly begin in this half hour to tell you all the things you need to know that are in the book. And, uh, and I hope that you get a hold of it and go through it. Now, um, did I come up with a question? Well, first of all, this is the first ever. Um, we did not have a winner for yesterday's question, so I'd like to repost it and let people have the weekend to... What was it? Maybe I'll... F I don't know it. <laughs> the question was... I have to find it. Give me one second. Who, mm. who was the only... Who's the only American president who went to war right. and emerged from the war more popular than when he uh, entered it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the answer. It's William McKinley. Um, there, it's a truism that wars are terrible for a president's approval rating. Initially they're good, but then they turn really bad. Um, the War of 1812, uh, James Madison was roundly condemned for that war, uh, and, uh, and it really hurt him badly. Um, the Civil War, Lincoln almost didn't win re-election in 1864. Uh, the Spanish-American War, a cute little nine-week war uh, where only a couple of hundred Americans were killed by the Spanish, more were killed by yellow fever, and that was wildly popular, very patriotic and uh, imperialist, really, and, and very effective in bolstering McKinley's image. And Theodore Roosevelt, who charged up San Juan Hill in that war, and that made his political career. World War I, Woodrow Wilson entered it with banners flying high, proclaiming this was a war to end all wars, and that this was to make the world safe for democracy. And by the time it finished, and we ended up giving everything away in the peace treaty of Versailles, uh, he was vilified and lost Congress that year, and his party was out of office for another 13 years. Uh, Harry Truman, responded, uh, Franklin Roosevelt went into World War II after Pearl Harbor was bombed, and though the country united behind him and fought for him, Roosevelt was almost defeated for a fourth term in 1944 by Thomas E. Dewey. He went from winning by eight or nine million votes to only winning by two, three or four million votes, and, uh, and Roosevelt's popularity declined sharply. Uh, Harry Truman uh, really couldn't run for another term because of his unpopularity as a result of the Korean War. And Lyndon Johnson pulled out of the presidential race in 1968 because the Vietnam War had cost him such popularity. And we all know how the Iraq War just destroyed the administration of George W. Bush. So wars are not good politics. So what we'll do is when we close out this show, we'll post the contest question and to give the hearing impaired a chance to respond, and on Monday we'll announce the winner. But before we close, Dick, do you have anything more to say? Because I have a question for you. Please. It's Friday. 
How about another Winston Churchill story to close out the week? Oh, okay. We could do that. But let's tell them what's going on at Facebook for us. Okay. Well, Facebook is launching their new um, watch program. It's We're actually going to have our own Deep Six to Deep State show. It's going to be on a different channel on Facebook. I um, mean, not Dick Morris Calm. No, it's going to be Deep Six to Deep State. But it's channel. not. It's a channel. Not everyone is going to access it. The, the full launch is going to go out on August 29th, I believe. So there's like a 1% population that have access, has access to it now. But I believe we can set up a link from your Dick Morris page to the show page. Okay. So it's, You'll be able to see it, sure. Yes. But it's very good. And uh, yeah, it exciting. really marks the transition from a project to a show. And uh, it's Everyone just, says that they want to see you on television, so this yeah. is it. So this is it. Yeah. Just move away from your television and you can <laughs> see me. <laughs> well, some of you know this story, but the supply of... Churchill stories is endless, uh, but uh, Lady Astor, who was the only woman in Parliament at that time, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, hated Churchill. Uh, Churchill was a conservative and she was a social reformer, and um, Astor was at a dinner.